I see the participants queuing up. Good evening, everybody. Just giving a couple of minutes um, for the participants to fill up and then we can commence, Professor. So just, I think we'll give a couple of minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, fine for me. <laughs> Can you check your mic microphone, Professor Sham, please? Your, your microphone? I, I hear you well. Your, your, your. I, I'm, I'm fine. Do you hear me well? I hear you well, but there is some noise around you. I mean, uh, the voice is not as clear as before. You are using uh, the... <laughs> سامعك بس في صوت تحس انه عامل ايكو شوي. Yeah, it does sound a little bit. Yeah. I can use only one. Is this is better? It's still the same. Still the same. Uh... Hmm. I, I will change the audio setting, okay? If you can, please. Uh, I, I do echo cancellation and an aggressive platform. You hear me well right now? I hear you, but not like the last song. No, I last uh, lecture. <laughs> It does sound, I'm not sure what happened, but it does sound a little bit muffled or... Yeah. Muffled? Yeah, it seems to be like this. Now, you can right now, is it okay? لسه برضو في حشرجة شوية دكتور هشام. أنا مش عارف من السماعات غالبا اللي عند حضرتك. كده هو كده طيب أخباره إيه؟ آه. I think it's okay, دكتور خالدة? Yeah, I think it's okay. And it's, clear, and it's not breaking. Though you were clearer, clear, clearer before, so I'm not so sure what happened, but we can we can hear. Okay. Yeah, we can hear. Is there any echo or? You've become clearer. Clear. Okay. So I'm I'm thinking. What do you think, Professor? We look like we have a good cohort of people. Should we just start? Yes, we can start right now. Okay. Um, so good evening, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to join us um, on this um, wonderfully interesting topic and um, this excellent panel that I'm uh, just uh, privileged to be amongst. Um, uh, we do have as uh, part of our panelists, um, uh, uh, Professor Francois Kaze and Professor Said Khamis, who I will introduce a little bit later. But I have the honor right now of um, uh, introducing um, professor Hesham El Sayed, who many of us know, uh, Emetrius, Professor of Nephrology at Ain Shams University and Head of the Nephrology Department at Ain Shams University. And I, he is known to me as the President of the African Committee for COVID-19 Pandemic and the Editor of the First Egyptian Hemodialysis Guidelines, which we are trying to adapt for African guidelines. And he is the head of um, the Hemodialysis Committee under the African Association of Hemodialysis. And he has so much experience in terms of being a teacher and in terms of being a guidelines editor and in terms of being a researcher. Um, so we're so honored, Professor, to have you here with us and to make this presentation for us on um, uh, hemodial filtration and its applicability in our clinical settings today. I mean, in the wake of uh, the CONVINCE trial, and uh, you'll have something to say about that and the basics of hemodialysis. So, Professor, um, may I welcome you and request you to start your talk, and thank you so much for making this presentation for us. Thank you very much, my dear friend Khalida. Uh, it's my honor to be with our friends in Africa, and I always say that uh, after uh, a while we have been away from Africa, 
Now we are day we are being in the land we are all belong. So it's always my great pleasure to be here uh, to my colleagues everywhere in Africa. Hopefully that this is my uh, our first talk on the hemodialysis committee, followed by uh, inshallah with a series of uh, hemodialysis in practice, starting from the basics of hemodialysis and ending by a full uh, training uh, program. Uh, tonight, we will have a hemodia filtration in a clinical setting. I will be more slower than uh, usual because it's an educational and we have to focus on each uh, message. So what uh, first we have to go by the agenda. This is our disclaimer. This is the following slides are for educational purpose only and all data are available uh, from uh, over the net for the further reading. And this is our agenda, which is uh, simply, we will go for a uh, different uh, hemodial filtration. Why? What is the water purification system? The basics of hemodial uh, filtration technique and the expanded or HDX versus hemodial filtration, how to choose dialyzers for patients to fit hemodial filtration, and our clinical experience in Enchamps University in the reduction ratio, and finally, we'll end by the latest randomized control uh, trial. So let us go why we need to do hemodial filtration. The uremic milieu and the uremic toxins have been expanded too much over the last decade. Going from the small solid clearance of urea creatinine, potassium and the other very small, tiny molecules going building up to larger molecules need to be removed. And it's correlated directly to mortality and the morbidity. So hemodial filtration should offer the perfect fit to do a clearance and reduction of the larger uremic toxins have been discovered up till now. It was believed that uremic toxins is a small solids, great, is important. However, nowadays we are looking about 50,000 Dalton of uremic toxins, which is the kappa and lambda, being in mind that it's not only related to myeloma. Kappa and lambda retention in patients with CKD and uremic are importantly to be removed because they are related to inflammation as well. So moving from the small solids to middle molecules and the larger molecules, we have to think about homodia filtration. Why we do that? Simply, is it correlation of the toxins, molecular weight, to all cause mortality and the cardiovascular death? So if hemodia filtration improves the uremic toxins, it should improve the all-cause mortality and the cardiovascular death. So why hemodial filtration? We are thinking about beyond the KT over V. KT over V simply measures the urea, and we have nowadays other biomarkers that should fulfill the reduction ratio of the major players in the cardiovascular disease and the other comorbidities in patients on dialysis. So a way far from the beta-2 microglobin 11,000 Dalton to the 50,000 Dalton of the aromic toxin, we have to fill this gap of removal by hemodia filtration. So in hemodia filtration, we look forward for uh, uh, removing middle molecules, small molecules, improving intradialytic morbidity, removing cytokines and inflammation, oxidative stress, improving cardiovascular stability with intradialytic hypotension prevention. So hemodial filtration potential benefits are over this function as well in others. You can improve the anemia, nutritional status, endothelial dysfunctions, growth in children, improving the cardiovascular remodeling and the vascular remodeling, better control of volume and the blood pressure. So if this fulfilling for the hemodial filtration benefit, we will get the benefit. 
the Ebola situation in Japan, the current status and the future direction are the molecular weight of solids that can be removed is generally larger in their Japan than in Europe. And this may explain why in Japan, the survival is better than Europe and for sure better than in USA. One of the great biomarkers is alpha-1 microglobulin, which is related to inflammatory reactions. It is around 25 to 30,000 Dalton. And you, I measured it actually in my research, and it is a potential future biomarker instead of KT over V. So we are looking about another biomarker for adequacy in hemodial filtration. We cannot depend on KT over V in hemodial filtration for the doses, but additional biomarkers with huge size, it is uh, typically 3x size of beta 2 microglobin and should be removed on hemodial filtration techniques. So hemodial filtration dialysis adequacy should meet the following. Exactly. One, and this is the uh, new adequacy parameters. We have to have beta-2 microglobin in reduction ratio about 80%, which is actually above the urea reduction ratio, 65%. This is one of the items that I should look for in the care of hemodial filtration adequacy. Beta-2 microglobin reduction ratio or a KT over V of beta-2 microglobulin above or equal 1.5. Or a pre dialysis beta-2 microglobulin below 2.5 milligram per deciliter. So all of these three parameters could be a potential biomarkers for HDF adequacy. Beta-2 microglobulin reduction ratio or beta-2 KT over V or a pre-dialysis beta-2 below 2.5. And I will explain why 2.5 exactly. So beyond that, beta-2 microglobulin, again, it's 11,800 Dalton, while uh, urea is only 60 uh, Dalton. So it is huger than urea by thousands of uh, 2,000 of the size. Why beta-2 microglobulin is a good biomarker in reduction? Because it is correlated on the mortality in the era of uh, high flux dialysis. In the latest buffs, phases from four to six, covering around 80,000 participants with four countries analysis, either in Japan, France, Italy, and Spain, they found that a beta-2 microglobin pre-dialysis above 2.5 will have higher risk of mortality. This ensuring, again, the previous studies saying that beta-2 microglobin is related with cardiovascular death, and it is also correlated with infection and hospitalization death. So this is why pre-dialysis beta-2 microglobin could be one of the adequacy a new uh, biomarker because it is correlated if it's above 2.5 with the uh, highest mortality rate. In order to do hemodial filtration, we have to do uh, water treatment. And this water treatment is the largest syringe in medicine. If you are looking to hemodial filtration, you have a huge amount up to 200 liters in pre-dilution, hemodial filtration will be used as a dialysate and a substitution. We have two kinds of water treatment station. We have the standard, which is the commonest, and the central dialysate delivery system. I will not uh, discuss the standard station, but will highlight the central dialysate delivery system. In order to do that, we need an ultra-pure dialysate as a substitution for the dialysate and a sterile dialysate to have such huge infusate. So in hemodial filtration, we need to have a sterile dialysate defined by an endotoxin level below 0.03 endotoxin unit per milli, 
and a sterile dialysis with a bacterial limit one per million. 0.03 is the limit to detect in the toxin in the, uh, by the kids. However, in Japan, they found that they can go down by 0.01. Again, 0.01 is lower than 0.03. And in order to do that, you need to do an ultra pure water and ultra pure uh, uh, formation of endotoxin by two endotoxin retention filters. We have in hemodial filtration what is called two barriers and the three barrier system. Two barriers mean you need to do uh, by sequential in uh, serial and into endotoxin retention filter behind the hemodialysis machine. So this is a two barrier system with two endotoxin retention, while the three barrier system, meaning that plus the first and second endotoxin, you have an additional one, which is the third one, and this third one is this uh, disposable, and typically it is a pack surface. So if you can use two in FMC and other machines, or three barriers like in Pexter with a disposable one. In our university and hospital, we are producing the sterile dialysis by using the central dialysis delivery system. And this is uh, uh, inside tubing systems are all uh, in uh, a way of performance. It's composed of a central supply and this central supply with a central dialysis delivery distributed along all the hemodialysis system with endotoxin retention filter. Behind each machine is a connection coming directly from the central dialysis delivery system in the water treatment station. And we don't use canisters, we only use here, uh, salts as packs here to be dissolved in such uh, containers. So the central dialysis are delivered all to all machine uh, behind that we don't use canisters up till now in our universe. I th this is uh, one, uh, I think it's only a study worldwide, which uh, I did a uh, couple of years ago, uh, effect of central dialysis fluid delivery system on interleukin-6 CRP level in prevalent hemodialysis patients. And we found that with regular hemodialysis, this is for regular dialysis, not HEDS, we found that with CDDS, the endotoxin level after the session is markedly lower than with the regular hemodialysis session. So endotoxin level are markedly lower in the group with CDDS and higher in the regular water treatment station. <coughs> Coming to the second point, what is the basics of the technique? We need several requirements to do hemodiafiltration. We have to know that vascular access is a critical one. Number two, we have to do sterile dialysis with the spec of endotoxin 0.03 in European and 0.01 in Japanese with colony forming unit one per million. Automated control hemodialysis machine with uh, feedback control I'll come back to that. And dialyzer fit for hemodialysis filtration. And this is, uh, will come in more detail. So this is the first four components with a vascular axis, sterile dialysis, automated control of hemodialysis machines, dialyzer fitting for hemodialysis filtration. What is the indication selection? It's about 20% of populations on dialysis from the global 4 million, worldwide is around 20%. And the perception of that in uh, nephrologist indication are mainly going to dialysis related amyloidosis, polyneuropathy, hemodynamic instability, 
10 years or five years more on the dialysis vintage, patients with decompensated heart, patients with diabetes, and the elderly. So this is the common indication to do hemodiafiltration among patients on dialysis. With a special application for hemodiafiltration, the cardiac, the elderly, diabetics, malnutrition, kids for growth, and with his uh, healthcare system payments, we have to implement the payments. We have to select from the population of dialysis the required. We cannot apply hemodiafiltration for all. And if we uh, select the patient, probably we have to do either a conventional three times per week or more intensified short dialysis or prolonged dialysis. We can build up the convection volume over time, especially in patients starting hemodiafiltration. Depending on the residual kidney function, we can build the dose of hemodiafiltration. So if the patient still has a residual kidney function or starting hemodiafiltration in uh, parameters of uh, increasing the dose, while the kidney function decline, we can increase the dose of the convection. We can use hemodiafiltration in incremental hemodialysis as well in patients on mental hemodialysis. So by these publications by Cano, my friend, and the report, they suppose that we can initiate hemodiafiltration prescription on naive incident dialysis patients, and this could be increasing the dose and adjusting the treatment schedule with increasing the dialysis convective dose, then we can monitor. Back again, we have to judge about the convection therapy to the volume of substitution of 23 liters in post-dilutional and on around 50 liters in pre-dilutional, but the biomarker is still would be a reduction ratio of beta-2 microglobulin above 80%. If we are using high volume online hemodiafiltration, we can have a convective clearance in the pre and post, but in the post is higher than the pre. We can have diffusive clearance because here is a pre dilutional mode. So the diffusive clearance is diluted from the pre dilutional dilatation. We need also a high blood flow. We need an arterial blood flow about 600 ml per minute and an ability to achieve adequate anticoagulation through the HDS mode. So what is the requirement? I need a dialyzer, higher ceiling of patients with lower albumin loss, anticoagulation. Remember that if you are using low molecular weight heparin, never to be injected in the arterial. It should be injected directly into the venous because passing through the filter will remove 30 to 40 percent of the low molecular weight heparin because it's molecule around 3,000 to 5,000 only. While the high molecular weight heparin could be injected in the arterial limb because its molecular weight is about 30,000. We need bigger size needles to maintain blood flow, 15. We need a negative pressure of arterial, not more than 200 for the blood flow, around 400 ml per minute. Target convective volume in post dilution is 23 liters, and you can control sodium, potassium, calcium, picarbonate as a parameter. You can use as well glucose to maintain the uh, uh, glycemic control of the patient during the session. So we have to do electrolyte prescription. We can control the bicarbonate, 23, calcium, magnesium, according to the patient needs. Usually the calcium is the usual 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 
potassium between two and three millimol per liters, and sodium should not be increased above 136. According to the vascular axis, the pest with arteriovenous fistula to achieve the target of substitution. So uh, around 86% of patients with AV fistula can reach this target. While in the graph, arteriovenous graph is a little bit lower, but it's okay. While the cancer is 33% only. <coughs> so patient with uh, uh, Central casters, double human central casters like Pemicast, may not have achieved an adequate substitution of 21 or 23. The reason for that is the low blood flow. We can increase the time to compensate for that. In the last few years, there is an expanded dialysis using the medium cutoff, which is the HEDX versus the HEDS. And you can have here, uh, two of the uh, big players in the field of dialysis, the Paxton and FMC. Paxton developed the Theranova, which is a medium cut of dialyzer, and uh, FMC are pushing toward the hemodialfiltration. I think, to my opinion, both are effective in removal of the uremic toxins, but never mix medium cut off with hemodialfiltration. So e either you have using medium cut off or using hemodialfiltration, don't mix between. The difference between that in the studies are equivalent in many molecules, like PETA-2 microglobulin, kappa lambda light chain, SPGF23, YKL protein. So the difference between HEDX and HEDS are equivalent. So in countries has no facilities for HEDS, they can use the expanded form of hemo dialysis or the medium cut off, but remember that albumin loss with HEDX is higher than with hemodifiltration, approximately about four grams per session in expanded hemodialysis. So one of the uh, challenges is using of medium cut off dialysis membrane, and this is in hemodialysis mode, not in hemodifiltration mode. And uh, in some of the uh, analysis with uh, uh, US dialysis and the other high flux dialyzer against medium cut off or uh, expanded hemodialysis, removing ratio of kappa and lambda. Here again, we are comparing high flux dialysis, not hemodialfiltration. But the alcohol loss with medium cut off is tangentially uh, uh, higher than for that for loss for patients on dialysis but still no hypoalpuminemia, probably due to increasing in the nutritional intake of patients on the arm. So what about the dialyzer to choose to fit HEDF? Not all high flux are equal. So we have to choose the best form of dialyzer in hemodialfiltration. So extracorporeal QP should fit with dialyzer. We can calculate it simply by 100 milli per minute blood flow per each one square meter of a dialyzer. So if you are using 2.0 dialyzer, you can have 400 milli per minute of blood flow. So this is an equation like that, 200 milli per minute per one square meter of a dialyzer surface area. According to the dialyzer type, you have to ensure removal of cytokine and inflammatory mediators. And this is the strong volume radius of the uh, porosity of the dialysis membrane. So if you are using such like a filter, it will be uh, higher than in the nanometers, and you can remove uh, a lot of toxin, but albumin loss will be higher. So usually we are using what's called super flux. So dialyzer should be suitable for high QP, preferably 1.6 and 1.8, 2.0 and higher. Seeding coefficient sufficient to remove middle molecules. Ultrafiltration coefficient of the dialyzer should be above 50. 
low internal blood flow resistance before uh, 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 to avoid clotting and the clogging and with an internal diameter of 200 micron to uh, ensure the uh, sustainability and uh, flow uh, smooth of blood inside. So this is basic requirement for uh, surface area, higher sealing coefficient to remove molecules and inflammatory markers, higher KOF, low internal blood flow resistance, and wider fiber internal diameter around 200 micron and above. So this is one of the crucial. Don't use hemodifiltration in dialyzers with an internal diameter of fiber below 200 micron because the flow will be interrupted, especially in patients on post-dilutional hemodifiltration. So we need adequate size with a relatively low internal blood flow and enhancing that in hemodifiltration clinical performance. Cytokine removal is essential in patients on dialysis. Remember, cytokines are amplifiers of any uremic toxin. So biomarkers of uremic toxin is with the same level between different patients, you will have a different effect provided that if the patient has an inflammation, it will be an amplifier to the toxin and the effect of toxin will be higher. So it is not simply a level, it's a level and effect. You can remove cytokines by diffusion, convection and removal by absorption, mainly cytokines because it's a big molecule removed by convection. This is a proposed cytokine. If you look at all above 17,000, interleukin 6, 18, tumor necrosis factor, and other like FPGF23. So we are using different fluxes. And this is the area of interest of a super flux that can remove 30,000 to 45,000. And this is the best fitting for hemodial filtration, and this is the best for Japanese uh, as well as My globin sealing coefficient is critical because my globin is 17,000 Dalton, and if you are using a my globin sealing around 0.5 to 0.7, you can remove a lot of cytokines. So this is one of the parameters of the dialyzer choice. This is a size, you can choose size here is 20, uh, six, which is 2.6, and we have a lot of clinical trials in that. So not all dialyzers are equal in hemodialfiltration. Considering beta-2 microglobulin, usually between 0.7 and 0.9, tangential difference, but if you are using additional information, like myglobin sieving coefficient, you can find between 0.1 and 0.7. So, pista hemodifiltration coming from higher sealing coefficient for myoglobin. This is a Paxton dialyzer. This is a cord diax. This is platinum. And this is the pyorema 0.7. So, we have a lot of clinical research. Uh, I published uh, uh, during the last four years. And accordingly, we are using 2.6 square meters surface area superflux in online hemodifiltration post dialysis with minimal clotting inside the filter. Here is from Enchant University, the university I belong. We are using 2.2 in post dilutional mode, adapted for high QP as before, we see 100 millipairs, 200 millipairs, one squid meter. So we can go up to 400 milli of the blood flow. And you can choose here from this data, the dialyzer you can choose, provided that you choose the myoglobin sieving coefficient. For example, the core dax here is 0.5 for the uh, myoglobin, while the same company producing FX has the sieving coefficient myoglobin is low, so it's not suitable for hemodifiltration. If you are going here for Paxter, 
you found Rivacare, my globin season 0.68, while the polyflux is only 0.37. Better to have dialyzer with a higher sieving of myoglobin. So the prescription of online hemodifiltration is 23 liters per square meter. So if you have a child or a body mass index is small patient, you can apply this calculation in post dilution mode, 23 liter per 1.73. You have to maintain the filtration fraction, which is defined by the ultrafiltration uh, on the QP. So in order to have between 25 and 30% in post dilution. So the only way to have a substitution of 23 with higher ultrafiltration rate, you, are, you must increase the blood flow. So here you can find increasing the blood flow from 300 to even 450, and subsequently, you can increase the substitution from 50 up to 125 to maintain a filtration fraction. So simple calculation is to increase the blood flow to increase the substitution volume. If you cannot do so, you can increase the time. You can increase the time to maintain better hemodynamic phosphate and anemia control. Who is the winner? The pre or post or mixed dilution hemodialysis. The pre mode is injecting the substitution before the dialyzer, while the post is injecting post dialyzer. To my opinion, post is better for patients with good vascular access, while pre is better for patients with poor vascular access. This, that's number one. Number two, if the patient needs no anticoagulation, like cerebral lesions or GIT hemorrhage, whatever, or bleeding tendency, never to go post dilutional because you will need a lot of anticoagulant. You can use pre dilutional with heparin free hemodiafiltration. So, this is pre dilution, better in patients with poor vascular access and better in patients needing no anticoagulation. Third indication for pre is the nutritional. post dilution lost more albumin due to higher pressure gradient than pre-dilution. Uh, so pre-dilution could be uh, applied for patients with malnourished or lower serum albumin. In most of the studies, of the pre versus uh, post dilutional, there is no, no significant difference in the spent dilation, but the reduction ratio again, and second part is the serum alpha microglobulin level. So we are focusing here on additional biomarker, which is the alpha microglobulin, which is better in post dilutional than in the pre dilutional way. Considering pre versus post, beta 2 microglobulin in the post dilutional is better than the pre dilutional, better than in hemodial. And KT over V, again, in post dilutional, better than pre dilution, and KT over V in hemodialysis is better than pre dilution because here the diffusion, as I said before, is lower than. He bought the dilution mode because of the dilution of the blood coming inside the dialyzer by a substitution of around uh, uh, 50 liters per four hours. What about the hemodialysis machine? Feedback control. The machine should have a feedback control. And this is the automated, typically, the automated mode of hemodial filtration, which uh, feeling the pressure. So coming to do control of ultrafiltration may have an O2 substitution, meaning that if the pressure increase, they push saline or dialysate inside the filter, so clearing up the uh, clogging of the dialyzer filter. Or ultra control, the same process according to 
the transmembrane pressure and the pressure gradient inside the dialect. And this is the scheme. You can find that. I will not go into details, but this is what's called an uh, automated pressure control of the hemodial filtration system because increasing the transmembrane pressure will have uh, uh, not a good uh, outcome. What about our reduction issue and the publication from my side and my colleagues in the university? We did a series of clinical studies. Again, we are controlling everything of the transmembrane pressure, the dialysis of surface area. We are controlling that of the transmembrane pressure. We are using here 2.2, and you can find that the transmembrane pressure in the 2.2 dialyzer are better than if you are using 1.7 or 1.8. Again, what about the beta 2? It is the marker of adequacy of hemodial filtration. We can achieve a beta 2 microglobin of 82% in a single post dilutional hemodial filtration using the 2.2 square meter dialyzer. We studied as well the hemodial filtration in the epigenetics with the DNA methylation and indoxyl sulfate. We didn't find a correlation in endoxide sulfate. What interestingly, hemodial filtration improves the DNA methylation and the epigenetic changes. And interestingly, it is related to substitution volume. And this is the only study worldwide that shows that substitution volume can reverse the DNA methylation if you are increasing about 22 or 23 uh, liters post dilution mode. We are removing a lot of uh, uh, reduction ratio of a lot of toxins like asymmetric dimethyl arginine, tumor necrosis factor. In asymmetric dimethyl arginine and tumor necrosis factor, we can have a reduction ratio very high approaching that uh, for uh, treatment and it's better for sure than in the high flux dialysis uh, group. Also, I studied the FGF 23 level and the cardiovascular calcification. We found that we can remove very big molecule in a huge amount in hemodial filtration in both the dilution method, and this could be uh, find to be a reduction issue approaching 70%. Again, this is my publication last year, 22, on the American Society of Nephrology using 2.6 high flux dialyzer. Here, this is the first slide uh, to show that, and this is the unique uh, literature on the reduction ratio of multiple biomarkers. We measure the kappa light chain. You can find 45% with hemodial filtration, alpha-1 microglobulin, Remember that this is uh, studied, takes about three to four years, so in 2019 started. Lambda, light chain, interleukin 6, 45%, procalcitonin 50% in four hours dial. Regarding the alpomin loss, we found that we have around two grams per session. The maximum loss during the first hour, as all the literatures, and the total album loss is two gram per session. Kilorostin level, I presented this uh, study on uh, uh, USDA, an annual dialysis conference. Uh, it's around uh, 2018 and published again in 2020. We can find that we can have a kilorostin reduction ratio of 27% in hemodial filtration group after three months. Final point, what is the latest randomized control trial? It's always shown that <laughs> from the Catalonian hemodial filtration studies saying that 23 liters and above will have the best overall adjusted all-cause mortality and cardiovascular 
mortality risk reduction, infection risk reduction, cardiac uh, death, sudden and, and uh, uh, sudden cardiac death, and this is typically for the uh, above 23 liters of the Catalonian. The convince, uh, how is this uh, convincing or not convincing? I am uh, not so convincing, but it is uh, one of the multi-center uh, clinical trial, and it's randomized, allocated uh, hemodial filtration to hemodialysis uh, around uh, equal one to one, uh, and three years follow up. Unfortunately, this study uh, came with the COVID pandemic, so a lot of patients lost during this era. The primary outcome are old cause mortality, with secondary outcome, uh, old cause and cardiovascular mortality, hospitalization, patient reported outcome, and cost effectiveness. With sub analysis published uh, two months, three months ago, the majority of patients on convent reaches the 20 liters and above of the substitution, so fulfilling the substitution volume, unlike uh, other studies. And this is uh, for the main substitution by convention studies. You can find that uh, achieving high dose hemodial filtration is feasible for nearly all patients in the convent. Considering the main outcome, there is improvement in all cause mortality. However, the cardiovascular one is not so as before, but improving all cause mortality. Uh, non cardiovascular is much better, infection related, and death from COVID is much better in convent. Even, uh, I discussed that with my friend, uh, Keno, and says that even patients with uh, uh, vaccination has an improved antibody response on hemodial filtration arm, this meaning that uh, even immunologically, the patient on hemodial filtration improving the response. So this is the convent. You can find that most of the parameters coming uh, uh, toward the high dose hemofiltration pattern, especially when the age is below 50. Uh, however, on diabetes, it doesn't uh, show uh, much better uh, results, but the majority of parameters are toward high dose hemodial filtration in convent. So there is improvement in the overall survival of patient on convent with in decreasing the heart ratio by 23%. High dose hemodial filtration uh, secondary outcome from the cardiovascular did not significantly uh, affected, not like uh, the Catalonian one. Death from uh, COVID, much uh, better in hemodial filtration. And uh, this, uh, the unmasking trying again, published uh, in November, just uh, one month before, to see the spotlight in real world. And they say that in subgroup analysis, the finding of online hemodial filtration demonstrate more favorable outcome in patients who are aged below 50 and above 65, and who did not already have a pre-existing cardiovascular disease or diabetes. This suggests that high dose online achieve its better results in healthier population rather than patients with multiple comorbidities. So it's HEDF it to make its triumphant entrance into the real world still is questionable. And according to the diagnosis outcome and the practice study, data obtained from the Middle East, it is around 20%. And this uh, trial is still not convincing in USA because USA has some restriction on uh, the substitution volume delivered by uh, filtration techniques through endotoxin retention filter. And from clinical uh, perspective, uh, hemodial filtration was easily implemented in daily practice by all clinics. Target convinced volume was achieved in the majority, about 23 liters, 
was never associated with any safety issue like fever, ultrafiltration volume, conditions or clinicians or caregivers concerned. Well tolerated patient dropout from the study was similar in both group. Again, and lastly, still we are in the field of efficient dialysis between expanded dialysis and the hemodialysis filtration. And both are uh, two techniques nowadays available and seeming that it's a potentially the best therapy for all patients if applicable in the country, feasible for the cost and for patient uh, criteria. And uh, my conclusion, Implementing hemodial filtration should be focused on individual patients' needs and would be best dialysis if we can ignore the cost. High volume HDF can have a better patient tolerability and reducing death by different mechanisms. And thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Professor. I think we have been riveted. I actually am getting so many messages and questions um, from the audience. I'll ask the audience um, to um, uh, start putting in their questions into the Q&A um, uh, chat. Professor, thank you so much for that amazing presentation. As you said, it was elaborate, yet simple and straightforward. A lot of <coughs> Um, uh, I'll take this opportunity to introduce our panelists who are here with us. Um, the first of whom, very well known to us, is Professor Francois Kaze uh, from Yaoundé. And he is a teacher to us all. I think many of us on this call, that's Victorine and uh, Maimona, and so many of us have learned from him so many publications. Um, the head of uh, the nephrology unit at his hospital. Welcome, Professor Kaze. And of course, uh, Professor. Thank Saeed. you. Yes, Karibu, that is in Kiswahili. Sorry, I've gone into Kiswahili. <laughs> <laughs> and Professor Said Kamis is currently the consultant nephrologist at Menofia University Hospitals in Egypt and the head of that uh, nephrology and transplantation um, unit of a very large hospital and um, published more than 50 articles in national and international medical journals. Um, so, welcome also to Professor. Professor Hamis is here with us. Professor, you want to say hello? You're welcome. Hello, Khalda. Hello, Professor Kaza. Thank hello, you. Sorry. Thank yeah. you so much to the both of you for being part of it, this. And I'll, I'll, I'll maybe start with uh, Professor Kaza, who is um, the co-chair of the Dialysis um, uh, uh, Committee under the African uh, Association of Nephrology. And Professor Kaza, we've had all of this information um, uh, from Professor Hesham and uh, I don't know what you think um, in this debate on uh, hemodialysis, high plus hemodialysis plus yeah. as compared to hemodial filtration. What are maybe your thoughts on that? Uh, thank you, Kalida. I would just want to congratulate uh, Esham for his uh, nice talk. It was uh, very, very interesting. And then uh, you just go straight forward to tell us and then to try to convince those who are not, who, are, who remain refractory to the hemodial filtration, not only hemodial filtration, but high volume hemodial filtration uh, from the result of this uh, convinced study. I think um, uh, hemodial filtration is uh, something like a baby from uh, Canos, and then since I started nephrology, he's the one defending and then try to convince people to uh, move from standard hemodialysis to hemodial filtration before it was low volume, and then now it's a high volume, which show the benefits not only in the clearance of middle molecule, but however, but the benefits of cardiovascular benefits, and then also uh, the benefits from, uh, as uh, we just uh, seen from the convinced study. The major limit for me, in particular in South Africa, Africa, South uh, Sub-Saharan Africa setting, is uh, due to the technical problem. Is the availability to obtain uh, the, a good uh, water treatment uh, uh, unit uh, to have uh, ultra pure water 
because it is the main challenge in my setting. I can assure you that uh, most of the nephrologists that I discussed with them concerning hemodial filtration, the main limitation is just the water treatment unit. If we can have a good water treatment unit, most of them will move from uh, standard hemodialysis to uh, hemodial filtration and uh, high volume. Because uh, most of the dialysis center now, we use um, uh, high flux uh, dialyzer, and uh, it's just for me, maybe those, uh, some uh, panelists will say, give their experience. The major limitation for us in Sub-Saharan Africa is the water treatment unit mainly. So thank uh, Esham and can make some contribution uh, depending on the question from the uh, those who assist the presentation. Thank, thank you. you, Professor Case. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kazi. I, I, I totally understand what you're saying because um, we have similar challenges within our own country. We have patients only dialyze twice a week. Um, uh, and maybe they would benefit most from HDF. I'm not sure. I'll ask that question. But maybe, Professor Famis, if you are able to um, give us your take or your opinion or your experience as to how your patients have fared with HDF in your unit. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Dr. Khalta. Thanks, Professor Kaza and Professor Hisham for this elegant presentation. Uh, I have uh, a rather than limited experience right now in Egypt regarding this, I mean, in our my unit on regarding HD, uh, HDF, uh, because we have only two machines uh, for financial reasons and the other reasons, as you know. But I worked in the Gulf area for uh, rather long time there. And they really they use this in a larger scale. I mean, almost 30% of their patient uh, using this HDF. And actually, uh, it is, it's just an observational. I cannot say it is a study. But uh, observationally, I feel that the outcome is better than this conventional uh, dialysis. Uh, other, other issue also uh, regarding the financial uh, constraints, you know, uh, I think it plays a great role also regarding the limitation of using this uh, HDF in the Middle East and, and Africa uh, on larger scale, as Professor Hisham and Professor Kaza said, uh, because the financial point, it is very crucial, as you know. Uh, if you allow me, Dr. Khalda, I may ask Professor Hisham some short, direct questions regarding his talk. Yes, it's please. Okay? I'm welcome, okay, my, my, my friend. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> thank you, Professor Rishan. Uh, the first, I will take one by one if you allow me. Number one, mm -hmm. based on convinced study, Professor Rishan, can we say in a loud voice or sound that HDF should be, or in another meaning, must be for all, or still not yet? Uh, even from convinced and others, and uh, from the DOP, from uh, uh, all other countries, there is still no charge decisions that hemodial filtration should be fitting for all. Uh, I was asked before, what do you think about the future of hemodial? And I answered in a very big round that the future of hemodial is not going for hemodial filtration. The future of hemodial is going to cover all patients in need in a local, meaning yeah. that you, you have 4 million patients on dialysis on the globe. Actually, more than 12 million are in need. So the future is to cover all patients everywhere, quite between anywhere in Africa, in Asia, who are poor, has no access. So this is the best. If you are talking about luxury countries, yeah. saying that money is nothing, you can go ahead with hemodial filtration because it shows in different studies as a better outcome in, in all cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, anemia control, volume control, blood pressure control, and the other. So it depends. If I'm in Switzerland, you're asking that on the mountain, and I'm skating right now, or after <laughs> shortly after the talk, I'll say, my dear friend, Camille, have, have, have a drink and let us do hemodial filtration. But now, if I'm talking in Egypt, 
I'm saying that it's costly. And if I go to sub-Saharan area in Africa, I say, oh, hemodial filtration, what about that? I need to cover 100% of patients on need, saving lives. So it depends on the answer on my geographic. Okay, after uh, the Zoom, I will ask you what about this, uh, the, type, okay. the type of the drink, is alcoholic or okay. non-alcoholic? <laughs> non -alcoholic. Second question, uh, what about the outcome of AKI necessitating renal replacement therapy using HDF versus conven conventional hemodial uh, hemodialysis? Yeah, you mean between intermittent hemodialysis and slow techniques is a prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy Again, it's uh, CRRT or continuous renal replacement service. So yeah. first, intermittent hemodialysis is the worst in the outcome. Yeah. But this is the global, according to the cause of acute kidney injury. And if you uh, compare between prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy, I push here sustained. I, I don't like sled, you know that, because okay. it makes nothing. It's called a sustained hemodial filtration. Technique, okay. again, CRRT, both are equivalent in the outcome, even in symptomic patients. Okay. Third, regarding, is there any, uh, I mean kidney transplantation, is there any study compared the outcome, either short-term or long-term, uh, for end-stage renal disease patient to wear dialyzed on regular basis with HDF versus other renal replacement therapy modality, namely uh, BD or conventional hemodialysis? For the pre-transplantation -tra pre or uh, transplantation yeah, yeah, outcome? Yeah, 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 I, yeah. Ask, I always ask this question. I no answer, no study saying that. But you know that the primitive the, uh, transplantation is better than, and so during hemodialysis journey, you have a lot of complications like vascular calcification, you have immune uh, 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 posting or immune reactions, blood mm. transfusion and so. But uh, if I have a parachute decision without randomized control trial, the parachute decision, mm -hmm. I say that it should be hemodial filtration, the best option for patient on the waiting list for transplantation. Okay, regarding the rate of decline of the residual kidney function, I mean GFR, HDF has any advantage regarding a versus, I mean, a conventional hemodialysis? It should be, yes, because it's more hemodynamic stability. You can control ultrafiltration volume. You don't have a stunning effect, either cardiac or renal stunning with ischemic lesions. You can mm. uh, smooth down the uh, technique. So uh, I don't have a, a randomized control trial in my hand, but definitely it should be better. Regarding the length of the dialyzer, I, I remember the figure 30 centimeter I mean the, Jap the Japanese or something like this. You are uh, very what, intelligent. What I'll, this pause, I'll pause this point, but you are very intelligent, yes. Yeah. What about this issue? Yes. There is two classes, one of the European class and one the Japanese class. The European class saying that like I know and the other, and I am from this class because I am research and development of the dialysis membrane 25 years, so I understand that well. Yeah. If you move Longer than 30 sound, you have a struggling of the blood flow inside the filter. You have more, more uh, uh, shear stress on the fibers. You have more uh, flow resistance, subsequently more uh, dialyzer clogging and clotting. This is the European style. Japanese style, they don't increase the size by the diameter. They increase the size by the length. So yeah. you, you can have longer. I am against that. I love the Japanese, but I am against this trend. To my opinion, total is better because it is, should be more uh, permeable, flow resistance is lower, still stress is better, and so the outcome and the clogging is better. Last but not least question, and thanks, Kalda, for giving me this long time. Please, please. Okay. Removal of X uremic toxin by hemodial filtration or whatever of the extracorporeal blood purification modalities can guarantee improvement in the outcome, namely uh, morbidity and the morbidity, mortality and the morbidity? Uh, another, uh, another intelligent question, my friend. 
I, I can explain for the genius. What is the definition of aerobic toxin? You should fulfill four things to define aerobic toxin. One, it should be, it should be chemically identified. Correct? Yes. Yeah. No, number two, it should be higher in patients with CKD on end stage kidney disease more than yeah. patients on volunteer or portion with no medical function. Number three, you have to be defined how to remove. And number four, that the removal should be applied to improvement of the disease. And that's why not all are supposed to be uremic toxins. If you analyze the filtrate from the filter on high flux or hemodial filtration, you can find that uh, more than 1,300 molecules present in the filtrate in uremic patient, not yeah. on the volunteer. So all of them are correlation, no direct effect. Yeah. You cannot find, you can say that, uh, okay, uh, pentrexin and uh, inducer dysfunction, protein pound uremic toxin and the cardiovascular, SCGF23 and the left ventricular, but you cannot find a direct disease related to each individualized toxin. Thanks, Professor Sham. Thanks, Dr. Khalda. And thanks, uh, thanks uh, Professor Kaza. I'm sorry for uh, taking a long time, okay? I enjoyed it. Yeah. Professor Hamis, I think we've enjoyed that exchange so much. I think it has answered so many of our questions. It's like one after the other. And I love it because there's one question over here by Wesley Tulekan, who is asking how HDF compares directly to PD um, regarding mortality and transplantation and quality of life. <laughs> But I don't think we have any direct comparisons, do we? Though to all of us, HDF makes sense technically. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, even hemodialysis, uh, or even combined hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, what is the mixing uh, renal replacement therapy, there is uh, some literature saying that mixing uh, is good to maintain patients once or twice per hemodialysis per week, and the uh, effect. It makes sense that it's a good approach. Uh, if you are doing hemodialysis, hemodialysis is not a single treatment. You can say globally a hemodialysis and the BD. What is the hemodialysis prescription? What is the dialyzer use? What's the water treatment? What's the duration of dialysis? What's the residual kidney function? Is a super flux or low flux? Even in BD, you can say that what is the fluid of BD? What's the a range of changing bags and what is the patient. So I cannot say uh, Ferrari uh, is better or the Porsche is better because we we cannot uh, compare uh, both of them. But regarding the outcome, both of them have the same outcome if it is done by the best practice. Okay. Professor Hamis, you had something to add to that? No, okay, I, I do agree, fully agree. Okay, thank you. I think one of the things that I will just comment on, and there's a, there was a question here regarding albumin loss and functional anemia. Uh, this is from Masoud Khairi and from Khaled Abdu, Abdu Zaid. And these questions were regarding um, uh, microalbumin as compared to albumin loss, uh, microglobulin versus albumin loss, and about functional anemia management. But just for us, even within the CONVINCE trial, uh, Professor uh, Hesham, um, CONVINCE didn't show any difference um, in hemoglobin, it didn't show any difference in phosphorus. And one of the things we would be interested in, for example, Professor Kaze has done some work on malnutrition and HD in children, if I'm not mistaken, Professor Kaze. But Professor Hesham, um, we would not recommend, um, as you said, would we recommend HDF in patients who are already malnourished and who we were worried about a malnourished patient? And correct me if I'm wrong, but we haven't really noticed much difference. There's some trials, but not in convinced definitely regarding anemia. And what would you say about beta-2 microglobulin uh, versus albumin loss? So it is a, a, it's a multiple question inside one. So uh, number one, malnourished, what is the first? It's a chicken or the egg. Is the patient malnourished from inadequate dialysis or malnourished from addition factor? If it is malnourished from inadequate dialysis, definitely hemodial filtration will improve. 
It's supposed to remove more toxins, protein pound is will be absorbed, and additional leptin and like that, and improve the nutrition. If you are fear, I said that if you are fear of albumin loss, you can use the pre dilutional mode. So there is no contraindication in malnourished patient or elderly or young or female or male to do hemodial filtration. So if you are uh, showing that patient needs more uh, nutritional state, you can have a supplementary, even uh, oral supplementary. I give oral uh, nutrition support by amino acids for patients that feeling of albumin loss. I can uh, give pre-dilutional mode because albumin loss is nothing. Coming to second question, is it improving or not improving anemia? Yes, there is a lot of improving anemia. Considering albumin loss, I had a sentence, it is five years ago. Now it comes to the light, but I am talking about that five years ago. And even I discussed that with Professor Cano and Ducatelli on that, on Milan. We should, again, we should remove some album because one is album turnover by the liver is 14 to 15 grams per day. If they have the amino acid, each one molecule of albumin is 585 amino acids. Number two, albumin in uremic meals are glycated. So a lot of glycated albumin we have to be removed. Number three, protein pound uremic toxin will not be improved if you remove some album. The question is to remove or not to remove. I am calling that it is a bad albumin and should be removed. The problem, how much I should remove? According to Japanese and the clinical studies, up to three grams is better to be removed during the session. Above that may be of a nutritional uh, issue. Hmm. Interesting. That's, that brings a whole other component. And I can see actually we are out of time. We have gone beyond time. And in the interest of everybody getting home, I will give you one last question, um, Professor Hesham. And this is again from Khalid, which is, I think he's talking about the super dialysis. He says, are we near to reach to more compatible semi-permeable charge membranes, such as nephron membrane, for better selectivity and differentiation between bad and good? What is good for clearance? So maybe you could answer that question. Professor? If I understand well, you are uh, selectivity on uh, uh, selectivity on uh, charge. Yeah, I think so. yes. Ah, yes, it's one one one, one sentence. All the alpha membrane are blind. They will not select. What's in the size will be on the pores. Yes. You, you can improve the hydrophilicity. So hydrophilic membrane will have lower protein firing and protein absorption on the wall. But what thing, how it is selective remove of the same size, it is not present up to now in any blind dialysis membrane. But it's more hydrophilic, lower thrombogenicity, lower protein uh, fouling or clogging. So this hydrophilic membrane is better. Wonderful. I think I'm going to leave it at that, Professor. I think we have a lot to think about. I think we've come out with a lot of questions and answers, but definitely a lot to think about and definitely better educated than when we came into this webinar. I want to thank you so much for taking your time to talk to us about this, for taking the time to prepare this amazing webinar. I want to thank Professor Kaze and I want to thank Professor Hamid for their time, for coming in to discuss this with us and giving us their ex expertise and experience. And I want to thank our audience for joining us and for the wonderful questions. And I will say, let's go and think about it. And let's, um, I've already challenged some people to come up with some data. And hopefully we should be getting back to you all soon. So thank you very much. I'll call this webinar to an end and uh, bid everybody adieu and a good night. Thank you very much. Very nice meeting. See you soon. Yeah, Goodbye. Good night. Okay. Thank good night. you. Goodbye. Have a nice Thank time. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.